Hey, Aaron Rabinowitz here for RedGiantTV.com. In this episode of Red Giant TV, we've got a very special guest, Angie Taylor, who hails to us from the Highlands of Scotland. Okay, well, that may not be true. Uh, she lives in England, but is definitely of Scottish origin. And since all I really know about Scotland comes from the Highlander and a haggis eating contest I once entered, which was not pretty, uh, I'm gonna go with that Highland thing. Yeah. Having a long history in motion design, visual effects, and animation, Angie still keeps it real by working and training in After Effects. So in this tutorial, she's going to show us how to create this cool retro 1960s pop art style animation. Take it away, Angie. Hi, my name's Angie Taylor, and today I'll be showing you how to use a combination of Red Giant plugins to create an opening title sequence for an art show named Pop Art Design of the 60s. This is a typical bread and butter job for a motion graphic designer. Often the expectation is for it to be created under quite demanding time constraints. So plugins like the ones used here can really speed up the process of churning out graphics while under a tight deadline. In this tutorial, I'll be using Red Giant plugins Plane Space, Echo Space, Sound Keys, and Warp to create this opening title sequence. Now you'll notice I'm working in a square pixel comp uh, if I open up my composition settings, you'll see I'm working at 1024 by 576 and square pixels. Now that's a very important consideration if you're using plain space or any other software that arranges layers in 3D space, is to work in square pixels. Otherwise measurements can be really confusing. If you work with non-square pixels, when you create a layer, what you think is a square with equal sides may in fact be slightly ski with due to the non-square nature of the pixels and of course ski whiff is a highly technical uh, phrase that I'm using there. Okay so what we're going to do is we're going to start by selecting uh, this layer here which is this little dancer. If I just preview that you'll see it's a little um, render I've done of a woman dancing in Poser, a cheap and cheerful software package um, that's great for creating little 3D animations. And what I've done is just uh, output it as an alpha, really, and used the alpha as a silhouette. So for now, first thing we're going to do is make it 3D, because we want to work in 3D space. And um, then what we're going to do is, is arrange it in 3D space. Now, we have an Align and Distribute panel in After Effects, but anyone who's tried to align and distribute 3D layers will have found out that it doesn't actually work on 3D layers. And this is where the um, plane space comes in. Used to be known as 3D Assistance from Digital Anarchy, and now known as plane space. And it's fantastic. It gives you all of these um, palettes that enable you to align and distribute your layers in various 3D uh, arrangements. So you've got things like cubic distribution, box creator to create boxes from layers. You can create cylinders, matrices, spheroids, pyramids even. Um, it's really fantastic. So the one that we're going to use is the Linear Assistant, which is probably the, the most basic one. There's also light versions of all of these that you can use, which give you a kind of cut down uh, number of controls. It's going to start by asking me what I want my starting value to be, and that's the position of uh, the first layer, which will be positioned, if you like. So I'm going to start with a value of minus 550. Um, so that's going to be the starting position of my first layer. And I also want to move them back a little bit from the camera. So I'm going to move it back by 100 pixels. Um, I'm then going to choose my spacing. And the distance section allows you to choose the distance between the layers. And I've already worked out that I want a distance of 220 pixels. And I'm going to make my minimum and my maximum the same and uh, use an increment of 1. And that will give me just the right amount of spacing between my layers. Now, there's a bit of experimentation goes on to work out what these values are. And, you know, when you get plain space and install it, I recommend that you have a play around with the different settings and really get familiar with it. Um, and try experimenting with two or three layers to begin with. Don't try and do anything too ambitious. And the linear assistant's a good one to start with because it is fairly basic, as I said. Now, we're going to choose to repeat layers. The other thing it will do, as well as um, aligning existing layers or distributing existing layers, is it will allow you to create new layers from within the dialogue. So 
If I want a total of five layers, I can say add another four layers and it will add them to the mix. Now I'm going to also ask it to create keyframes. You can use these assistants uh, to create quite funky animation. You can animate between one point and another and I'm going to do that here so I'll show you how that works. And then we want to have them distributed. Um, now Linear Assistant allows you to distribute only on one axis. You have other ones like Cubic Distribution which allow you to distribute the layers across the X, Y and Z axis. Linear Assistant, as the name implies, allows you to do it on one axis. So at the moment, it would distribute it in Z space. So I want it distributing along the X axis. So I'm going to choose X. OK, and all I need to do now, if I just move this out of the way, is click Apply. And you'll see it creates the multiple copies of my layers and places them in a line, just as I wanted. Now, if we go down to the timeline and just select those layers and hit uh, P on the keyboard, you'll see it's created uh, position keyframes there for each of the layers. Now, if I want to create an animation, I can just go to the one second mark and um, use the assistant again using maybe some different settings. So let's just mix up the settings a bit. Let's uh, change the settings to let's try 650 on the X axis and we'll leave the Z axis at 100. And uh, what I want to do here is I want to get them to move off to the side. So what I'm going to do is make sure there's no space between them. So if I take the spacing out between them, uh, put that at zero, what it will do is move them all to a value of 650, which um, which will just be off, off the side here. Now, we don't want it to repeat layers this time. We just want it to work with the existing layers. And again, I want to create keyframes so that it will animate between one point and another. The rest of the settings, I think, can stay the same. And then we click Apply. And you'll see now, if I just close my Linear Assistant, um, that we're now moving from that point to that point. OK, so moving them off screen over time. Now, I really want the opposite to happen. I want them to move on screen. So what I'm going to do is just select all those keyframes and go to my Keyframe Assistant, Time Reverse Keyframes and now we'll have them moving on screen. Now I want to create a kind of Bond-like effect here, but there's, it's not quite right because in the Bond titles, they move on in groups. They don't kind of concertina on like that. So what I need to do is just make a slight adjustment to the keyframes and uh, it's quite easy to do that now we've got the keyframes. What I can do is I can just, um, first of all, stagger them in the order that I want them to appear. So we just need to select them one by one here, just to check that they're in the correct order. And of course they're not, so you can see there, um, this one should be down at the bottom, so that when I select them, it selects one, two, three, four, five in the correct order. Now we then need to have a look at it and say, okay, which one do we want to move on first? And really I want this one to move on first, which is the top one. So what I'm going to do is use the Sequence Layers keyframe assistant to sequence them. But in order to do that, what I really need to do is just trim them all to that length. Um, because otherwise it will sequence them from the start and end point of the layer. So to trim them, I can hit uh, the Alt key and the right square bracket. And that will trim all of my layers at that point. And if I select them in the order that I want them to appear, and then go to Keyframe Assistant, Sequence Layers, I can just click OK and you'll see that I now have my layers sequenced in the correct order. OK, now you'll notice because they're trimmed, they're kind of coming on and then disappearing. So what we need to do is just quickly extend the layers again so that they last for the duration. Again, using Alt right bracket just to extend them to the end of the comp or to the position of the time marker rather. Now, as I said, what I want them to do is come on in groups. So number two should move from here rather than from here. So we need to do a little bit of keyframing with that. So all I'm going to do is move to here, uh, which is where this keyframe is. And instead of moving on from here, I want it to move on from the end point of this layer. So all I need to do is just copy this keyframe. OK, Apple C or Control C on PC to copy and then paste it into here. OK, so now that layer moves from that point. Similarly, the next layer, I want to take this keyframe, copy, 
and paste into there. And now that one moves from that position. Okay, we'll do the same with this one. Copy and just paste into the next keyframe. Okay, wasn't quite on the keyframe there. If you want to make sure you're on the keyframe, the J and K keys will jump between visible keyframes. So if you want to just make sure a keyframe is right on the button, use the J and K keys. So again, copy that one and then paste it into here. Okay, finally this one, copy K key to move forward. Make sure I'm right on the keyframe and then paste into here. And if we preview that now, you'll see that the layers move on quite nicely one after the other. So let's just preview that. So each one is revealed behind the one, the preceding one, if you like, which is um, exactly the same effect that was used in the James Bond title. So I'm just really taking a leaf out of that book. OK, so the next thing I want to do is I want to get them to spin round as a group. And the easiest way to do that is to use nulls. So what I'm going to do is just close up these layers and add a null. So I'm going to say layer new null object. Very important, if you're working with 3D layers, you want to create a 3D null. And we also need to make sure it's in exactly the same position um, in Z space as the other layers. At the moment, if we have a look from the top view, so let's just switch to two views and I'm just going to move my info palette over there for a second. Um, so let's just switch that to top view. And you'll see that the null isn't quite in the same Z space as the other layers. And that's because I moved them 100 pixels back. So I'm also going to move the null 100 pixels back. So it's in exactly the same place. And all we need to do to get all of those layers to rotate as a group is just parent them to the null. Okay, so I select them all. And if I grab the Pickwick for one of them, it will link all of them to that null. So all I need to do to get this to rotate as a group now is to simply rotate the null. And by rotating the null, I'm also rotating all of the other layers. So let's just jump back to one view. And what we're going to do is animate it uh, between, let's say, uh, 714. OK, which is where this marker is. So you can create these little markers and just jump to them using the number keys on the keyboard. Or you can type in or scrub the time code here. Either way is fine. So we're going to set a Y rotation keyframe there. And then we're going to jump to uh, 16 seconds. So I think I've got marker 2 at 16 seconds. Uh, not quite. Let's just go back one second. So go to 16 seconds. And what we're going to do is put in, let's say, six rotations. So we'll have six spins between those two points. And again, if we just do a quick preview of that, you'll see they move in, they spin round six times, and then they come towards the camera. OK, so if we ram preview that, you'll see they move on screen and then they rotate around. Now, I've also animated the camera. So after they've rotated a few times, they're going to zoom towards the camera. Now, you may notice as it's zooming towards the camera, it gets a little bit ropey because we're obviously we're taking a small layer and we're blowing it up. But I'm going to show you that once we apply motion blur to that, so we'll apply motion blur to all these layers down here, um, that that's going to smooth that out. Now, you want to make sure that your motion blur settings are fairly high. So you can see here I've got samples per frame at 64, which gives me a nice smooth motion. And we've got the shutter angle at 180, which is probably enough. And um, you can mess about with that to improve that even more. And um, we'll also, before we uh, render, switch on depth of field for uh, the 3D camera. And that will also improve uh, the effect of this for us. Now, the only other things that we're going to do is just quickly easy ease um, the keyframes. So we'll easy ease in for the end keyframe, easy ease out for the beginning keyframe. And if we preview that, you'll see it previews a little bit more slowly now, but we've got some nice motion blur applied, which just adds a little bit of realism to the movement. Uh, once you see that preview in real time, you'll see that that really adds a lot to our animation. Now, what I'm going to do is just switch on uh, audio so that you can preview it with audio. OK, so you'll see now if I ran preview it. OK, 
Okay, so you get the idea. We've got them coming on one at a time, rotating around. Now, you'll see that with um, both motion blur and uh, depth of field that it, you know, as it's moving quickly towards the camera, it really doesn't, uh, you don't notice the dodgy edges, as I call them, another official technical term there. So what I'm going to do, though, is it takes quite long to preview with motion blur on. So I'm just going to use the enable motion blur button to switch that off. Now, you can also uh, open up the depth of field settings and switch them off if you're finding things are running a little bit too slowly. And of course, that can be overridden when you output. Now, we're now going to work on the second section here. And what I want to do here is um, have create multiple instances of this character here. Now, I could use... Um, one of the assistants again, so I could select this layer and use something like a uh, cubic distribution, which is fantastic. I'm just going to choose to distribute it randomly um, within a space of 1000 on the X axis and 1000 on the Z axis. If I don't want to distribute them on the Y axis, which would make them move up and down, I can change that value to uh, one, tell it how many layers I want. So let's say 20 and apply it. And you'll see, if we have a look at that uh, in custom view, you can see it creates lots of versions of this layer. Now, the only thing about that is I don't really want random layers, so I'm going to undo that. And what we're going to do is have a look at another plugin from Red Giant, which allows me also to distribute layers in 3D space, but also allows me to animate them using expressions. It automatically generates expressions for you. So it means if you're nervous about expressions, you don't need to worry because it's all taken care of in the background for you. And it's called Echo Space. So I'm going to go over to uh, my Effects and Presets panel. And of course, all of these plugins are available as trials. So you can download the trials and try them out for yourself and use them for this tutorial. I've included the project here so you can play around with this yourself. So I'm going to drag it onto my layer and that opens it up in the Effect Control panel. Now, the first thing I want to have a look at is the setup. Um, how many instances do I want to create? Well, in this case, um, I think I'm going to stick to 10. So we'll create 10 new layers. Now, you don't need to go in and decide on the offset values before you um, click on repeat, which will create your extra layers. And that differentiates it a little bit from the assistance. So you can just click repeat and it will automatically create them. And again, if we go to switch to two views so that we can see what's happening in our top view simultaneously. So we'll look at our top view. Let's just switch off the transparency grid. And if we have a look there, you can see the layers. You can see the layers moving apart. Um, so what it does is it automatically uh, puts a little bit of Z space between the layers. That's the default setting. So I'm actually going to switch back to one view because I haven't really got that much space here. You'll see that it puts an offset of 10 in. Now I'm going to change that. I'm going to change it to a Z offset of 191. And you'll see that if I scrub that, it's quite nice to see it interactively change. Um, and I can get an idea of what that value is doing just by clicking and scrubbing it. Of course, I can type in a number as well if I want to. So there we go, we've got a spacing of 191 on the Z axis. So we're going to change the X offset as well, and we can just uh, nudge that value um, in increments of 10 by holding down Shift and hitting up and down arrow keys, or we can just type in our value, which in this case is going to be minus 197. Again, I've experimented with the values just to find exactly what I need uh, for this situation. Now you can also add things like rotation in there, which are, um, are quite fun. See there, I can start to rotate the layers over time and create these mad spiral effects. Um, so it's a really quite creative um, plugin. And of course, all of these could be animated over time. Um, I've also animated the camera as well. So if we just uh, do a little preview of that, you'll be able to see it uh, animating um, as the camera moves along the row. Uh, you can see them all dancing in time with the music. And then we halt at this point with the dancer just standing there dancing. And at this point, I want to bring in uh, my titles. 
Now I've created a little text animation here. I'm going to switch that on and you can see that starting to preview. Let me just switch off audio and um, do a little RAM preview of that so you can see what's happening as I'm talking. Uh, I've used an animation preset. I've spent a bit of time uh, formatting the text. I've used a free font called Fillmore so that you can download that and use it yourself. Um, there are better psychedelic fonts, but this one was fine really for this tutorial. And I've spent a bit of time formatting that using things like kerning and baseline shift and, uh, of course, font size just to create a little bit of interest in the layout. And um, used a modified animation preset for that, which I've saved in the animation presets folder. Now, if you download that font, um, you can use that yourself. And if you hit the shy button um, here in the timeline, you can see, and let's just um, extend the timeline uh, by using the tilde key on the keyboard. Uh, that allows us to see the timeline maximized. Um, you'll notice here is a composition, um, text animation composition. And if I uh, alt double click that, of course in CS5, if you just double click it, um, it will open up the original composition. Um, you'll see here is the animation preset. And if you select it, double hit the U key, you'll be able to see all of the values that have been changed to create that little text animation. So you can recreate it yourself uh, using that composition. If you don't have that font, um, as I said, there's a ready-made movie here that you can use. Now, because we've hit the shy button, you'll notice that some other layers have opened up. And these are these ones here. Now, these are the um, other instances that Echo Space has created. So Echo Space doesn't just create an effect. Um, it creates actual layers. And if you double hit the E key with those layers selected, you can see that it's created expressions to control the layers. Um, and it's quite a complex set of expressions. Obviously, it'd be quite um, intimidating to have to add those all yourself. So that's the work that Echo Space does for you. It creates all these layers, makes them shy so that when you click the shy button, you can only see one control layer. And then by using the controls, you can control all of those instances just by adding things like scale and rotation um, to the layers. You'll see I can scale them up, rotate them, as I showed you earlier, and adjust all the transform properties over time. So it's a really get, great way of animating multiple layers, creating multiple layers, without having to physically manage them yourself. Okay, so what I want to do now is create a background. So I'm just going to hit the Home key to move the time marker back to the beginning, hit the B key to reset the work area to the beginning, and we'll create a new solid by going to Layer, New Solid. Or you can hit Apple Y or Control Y on the PC. We'll call it BG, because it's our background layer. Make it the comp size, click OK. And then we're going to do a search for our Grid Squares um, filter, which is one of the Red Giant plugins, of course. And what that does, if we just preview it, we'll see it emanates squares from the center of the screen. I'm just going to solo it so that we don't have to wait for all the other layers to update. If we go into our settings, you can actually um, switch on the grid so you can see the area that the squares are being emitted from. Now, of course, you can change this area. You can type in values. So I could reduce that to 100 by 100. Um, or if you want to extend it to cover the whole layer, you can click Make Size Match Layer Size. And now we'll get the particles being emitted across the whole area. Now, of course, um, they're not being emitted from the whole area. They're spreading across the whole area. And that's what the grid controls. If you want to actually adjust the area that these are emitted from, which at the moment is from the centre here, you then go into the producer point uh, section, which we're going to have a look at in a second. But before we do, what I want to do is make sure that these are squares. At the moment, these are rectangles, the units on the grid. So I want to change them to um, uh, squares. So I know from experimentation that a value of 11 will give me squares. Now, of course, you can scrub those values and experiment with them to find the right value for you. Incidentally, when I'm working with new plugins that I've never worked with before, what I tend to do is... Um, 
look at the different sections one by one. Now, the plugin developers place things in the order that they think you'll need to adjust things. So they split them into these nice logical categories. Um, so basically start with the first category. Scrub values just to see what the individual controls do. And once you've scrubbed the value and you've ascertained what that uh, individual control does, just right click on it and go to reset. And then you're back to the default value and you can move on to the next thing. Have a look at what that does and reset it. Once you have an understanding of what all the controls do in isolation, you can then learn to combine them to get the exact effect that you're looking for. So as I said, we're going to adjust uh, the area that these particles are emitted from the moment they're emitted from this area here. If we're going to our producer point settings, we can actually scrub that value to move the producer point up and down the screen. If we scrub the X value, you can move it left and right. So you can create an animation of particles being emitted and moving across the screen by doing that. Again, once I realize what that does, I just reset it back to the default values. I don't want to change the position of the producer point, but I do want to change the width and the height. So I'm going to change the height to 300. And you'll now see that they're being emitted from a, a higher uh, section of the screen. And if I change the width to 800, you'll see now if I preview that, that new particles are being created all over the screen, not just from the center. And then they're moving around the screen. Okay, so what I'm going to do is close up that producer point. We'll leave the grid on for, for now, and we'll go into our square setup and have a look at what we can control in there. Now, the first thing that I want to adjust is the shape of the particles. You can choose from squares, diamonds, arrows, stars, all different kinds, even martini glasses, if you want to have martini glasses um, emanating from the center of your screen, you can do that. Um, you can also use custom shapes as well, um, using the text anarchy uh, filter. But I'm going to choose 32 side the poly, which in effect gives me a circle. The other thing I'm going to do is just ask for it to show outlines only. So it's only giving me the outline. And I'm going to zoom in to 100% so you can see these. They kind of look a bit like bubbles now, little bubbles coming out. Now, I want to adjust the outline width to 16. Again, I've experimented to find out what I need for this particular setting. And I've chosen a setting of 16, which initially closes up the circles, but... If I go down to my square attribute settings and I adjust the size of these, you'll see a hole starts to appear in the middle. Now I know that at, at, at the moment, the setting that I've got makes these particles grow from a minimum width of five up to a maximum width of 53 during the animation. And that's why they vary in size. I want them all to be the same size. So I'm gonna put a minimum of 40 and a maximum of 40 for width, and the same for height, minimum of 40, maximum of 40. And now we have them all exactly the same size, and you'll notice that they have a small hole in the center, which is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to create the effect of the old vinyl 45 singles that you used to get. Um, they also look a little bit like sequins, so it fits in with the kind of dancer theme with the sequins, and it fits in with the theme of the 60s, um, with these like 45 singles on vinyl. So that's the kind of theme that I want. Now there's a couple of other things that I'm going to change in here. I want more particles and I'm just going to go back down to 50% so you can see an overall view. Notice that you can't see the holes anymore when I'm at half resolution. So when you're working with filters, it's quite important every now and then just to jump up to 100% full resolution, just to check that everything's looking as it should do. But this is enough for previewing. I just want to see the overall uh, distribution of the particles. So I'm going to put the value up to three and you'll notice we have more particles when we do that. Now, the other thing is, if you have a look at the movement, what's happening here is each particle is produced, if I scrub through slowly, in one square of the grid. And then this, the, the particle moves from that square randomly across uh, the grid and you can control how it moves by adjusting these settings. Now, uh, if I 
want the particles to remain in the grid and not move, what I need to do is change the setting for speed to zero, and that stops them moving. And you'll notice now that they're produced in a square of the grid and they remain in a square of the grid. And then they kind of fade in and out within that grid. Now the fade settings are what controls uh, how fast it fades in and fades out. And you can see those settings here. I'm going to leave the fade in and out um, on five. You can adjust the randomness if you want to kind of get a more random fade in and out. If you don't want it to be as uniform. And again, that's quite a nice effect. Okay, I'm going to put them back to their default values just by resetting them. Okay, final thing we want to do is just go ahead and adjust the colour. So I'm just going to uh, close up my squared attributes. I find that it helps to um, uh, understand things if you just keep things closed up and simplify the, the look of the plugin. It just makes it easier to understand what you're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick with reds and I'm going to choose four different reds getting gradually darker as we go down. A red fits in again with the 60s theme um, and also we're getting a nice monochrome look which is also quite 60s themed. So we're sticking with red, black and white which gives us a nice monochrome look. Okay, so there we have our uh, circles animating. I'm just going to change the colour of that one, darken it down a little bit. Uh, we'll darken that one. Okay, and then all I need to do is just go and switch off the grid so we don't see the grid. And if we preview that, I'm going to put the audio back on again and let you see that with the audio. Okay, so we'll just do a few seconds of that and preview it. Okay, so it's looking really nice, but um, it's not really animating in time with the music. So that's our next step. We're going to get this to animate in time with the music. Okay, so now comes the fun bit. What we're going to do now is we're going to uh, use a plugin called Sound Keys, again from Red Giant. Uh, to control some of the properties of this layer to make them animate in time with music. Now, instead of creating it within this comp, what I'm going to do is create a new composition. And that just saves me from... Uh, so we'll call it Sound Keys uh, Control. Uh, and it saves me from having to wait for the other layers to render right, while I'm working on Sound Keys, if I can just work in a separate composition. Again, I'm going to add a new solid by hitting Apple Y, Control Y on the PC. We'll make it the comp size, click OK, and double click Sound Keys to apply it. Now, Sound Keys won't work if there's no sound in your composition. So the first thing you need to do is bring in your audio. And my audio is called Groove, so I'm going to type in Groove, find it in my project panel, and drag it into the composition. As soon as I do that, if I open up my effect, I can select the audio layer and what it does in sound keys is produces this nice waveform for me, for the audio. And we can then use selections to select parts of the audio that we want to control our layer. What I'm going to do is just let you preview a little bit of this. So let's just preview a few seconds just so that you can listen to the audio and see how the waveform reacts to the audio. <laughs> So what's happening here is I have a selection area uh, to select a range and the range controls are here in the plugin. So I can either scrub these values or actually move the selection down here in the interface itself. And I select a range of values that I want to control my properties with. This then shows me the output. So this shows me the result of my selection here. So if I put this range up to maybe here, you'll notice that I'm only getting an output value when these frequencies touch this area. Now you'll notice that as they touch the area, I'm starting to get values showing there. Let me just preview that without the audio so you can see it working. So as these move into this box, 
we start to get the values showing here. When they're not in that box, we don't get any values. Okay. So this is kind of what I want. What I want to do is capture those trumpet sounds at the beginning. And if you have a look at the waveform with the audio on, you'll notice that these bars here echo those sounds. So let's just have another little preview of that. <laughs> Okay, so if I move this up to here and preview again, I'm starting to capture those sounds. Now, the only thing is, what's happening now is it's taking an average of the range that enters the box and creating an output setting for that. But what I want to do is just have it an on-off trigger. So we're going to control opacity, and I want opacity to either be on or off, rather than animating between all the values. So I'm going to choose an on-off trigger, and that gives me this line. Now, what's going to happen now is it's not going to register a value until one of those uh, frequencies hits that line. So I'm going to move it down to about here, and we're just going to have a little look and see how that's going. Again, concentrating on looking at the output values. So it's picking up a little bit too much at the moment, so I'm going to make it narrower so it's not picking up as many frequencies, and we'll preview it once more. Okay, we'll make it a little bit higher than it was before, and I think that should be about us. So what I need to do now is actually apply these uh, values to the opacity of this layer here in my uh, start composition. So I want the opacity values, so if I select T to open up the opacity values, I want to get these controlled by this effect. So how do I do that? Well, the first thing I need to do is actually create keyframes from this effect. And I do that by clicking the Apply button. Now, you could take a little bit longer to perfect this, and obviously I would recommend that you spend a bit longer than I've done here to really get this, the sound keys right. But once you've done that, if you hit the U key on the keyboard, you'll see your key keyframes that have been created. And I can select them by clicking on the output value here. I can also look at the graph that's been created and there you can see the values if I zoom in um, on the graph. And these are what are going to be used to control the opacity value of the other layer. Now, what I'm going to do is create an expression to link the two values together, but I really need to be able to see both compositions simultaneously. So what I'm going to do is drag Sound Keys tab and place it above my other tabs. And that way, I can see multiple timelines simultaneously. So I can see my sound keys keyframes, and I can also see the opacity value of my start comp. And what I'm going to do now is add an expression. So you can either do that by selecting the value and going to animation, add expression, or an alternative way is to hold down the alt key and click on the stopwatch, and that will add an expression to your layer. Now at the moment, it's telling my layer to take its opacity value from the transform property group opacity value. So it's basically saying, take your value from yourself. So nothing has changed at the moment. But I can use this thing here called the pick whip to take my value from somewhere else. And I'm going to take it from over here. Now at the moment, this value reads 100% and this reads zero. Now watch what happens. If I drag my pick whip over, I can select the output value and it writes an expression for me. And what that expression is saying, I haven't applied it yet, so we won't see the values changing till I apply it. But just to explain what it's doing, it's saying, take this value, the opacity value of the background layer, from Comp Sound Keys Control, which is this composition here, Layer Background, and that's my background layer, Effect Sound Keys, Sound Keys Effect, Output 1, Output 1. 
And if I uh, just accept that by clicking enter on the number pad, you'll see it's created an expression and it's changed the value to zero to match the value here. If we preview that. <laughs> Now at the moment it's flashing on when the sounds come on. I want to reverse that so that it flashes off when the sounds come on. So what I'm going to do is edit the expression. So I'm going to add a semicolon and add a new line. And this is a really useful expression for controlling uh, sound keys output and for other uh, expressions as well. And it's called linear. Okay, and the linear expression allows me to take values from this and convert them. So the first thing I need to do is set up what's known as a variable. And a variable just means that I don't have to type out this whole line. I can just make the letter A equal that line. So from now on, if I want to reference this value in my expression, I just need to use the letter A. So after linear, I'm going to open parentheses and uh, you can also just apply this linear expression from the uh, expression language menu. You'll, you'll have uh, the linear expression is in there somewhere in interpolation, I think. So you can actually just uh, apply it from there and edit it. But I'm just typing it in from scratch. So the first thing you need to put in here is uh, the value. And the value is represented now by the letter A that we created um, with a variable. And then comma. And then what you want to do is put in the start, the, the current start and end value. So the start value is zero. The end value is uh, 100. And then after those, you put what you want those values to be. So I want zero to be 100. Whoops. And I want uh, 100 to be zero. So I'm basically just reversing the effect. Once I've done that, I can hit enter. And you'll now see if we preview that we have the lights flashing off in time with music instead of on. So I'm just going to preview a little bit of that for you so that you can see that effect. So let's have a little look at that. OK, so it gives us a much nicer effect. It's just flashing off in time with those beats, which is quite nice. So what we're going to do is go back to our uh, background layer, our sound keys, and we're going to have a look at range number two. Now I've already set up some values for range two, just to save a little bit of time. Um, and what I want to capture here is I don't want to capture any frequencies until this point where the music changes and starts to get a little bit more manic. And we have like the mad keyboard starting there. And that's what I'm capturing there. Now you'll notice again, it's capturing an average of the range. Um, so that's the default setting. And I'm going to show you what that means in a second. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply it. OK, so we'll click on apply. And you should see the sound keys effect update now with two sets of keyframes, one for output two and one for output one. Now, if we have a look at the graph, you can see the units of uh, measurement on the graph. And you can see the values are ranging between 0 and about 20, Okay, which isn't going to give us a very strong result, which is actually what we want here. Now, I just want to show you as well that if you change uh, these settings, so if I change that to an exp exponential falloff, and then click Apply, and then select keyframes, you'll notice I get a very different type of graph. OK, uh, because it's actually uh, adjusting the, the fall off values, if you like. So we're getting instead of a linear sort of drop in value, we're getting it exponentially getting less. So I'll show you what those different values do in a second. We'll first of all, stick with our, our linear values and have a look at those. Now, notice that the values don't start till about eight seconds, which is exactly what I want as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go down to our background and this time we're going to open up our effect. And if I double hit the U key, you'll see that it opens up any values that have changed from the default value. So it means that very quickly I can go down 
and just look at the settings that I've already adjusted without having to scroll through all the others as well. And the thing that I'm going to animate in time with the outputs to settings is the speed. Now remember the speed um, determined how these uh, circles moved. If I adjust my speed value, notice they all start moving around randomly. Okay, I don't want them to move around all at the same amount. What I want them to do is move around depending on these audio values. So what I'm going to do is add an expression again to the speed value by alt clicking on the stopwatch and then drag the pick whip to output 2. Hit enter on the number pad and if we just preview from uh, around about say 8 seconds, let's do it from there, you should see the result of that. So we've now got the odd particle moving off now and then in time with the music, which gives us a really nice effect. What I'm going to do is allow that to build a few um, frames there, and then we'll do a RAM preview so you can see the particles starting to disappear in time with the music or triggered by the music. So at this point, the particles are all remaining static. They're being controlled, their opacity. And then at this point, when the music starts, they start to move off. Okay, so we get this random flying off. Now, I could leave that as it is, but if I decided I wanted to use the linear expression, I could maybe adjust that um, to faster values. So to do that, I would again look at my values. Now, I can read from the graph, but a better way of doing it finding out your minimum and maximum values, is going to the info palette. And if you select your keyframes, um, it will tell you there, if we go to our speed graph and select all our keyframes, it will tell you your minimum and maximum values. So we're working with a minimum of zero and a maximum of 20.94 or 21. So if I say A equals, again, for my um, variable, Create a new line, linear, open parentheses, letter A refers to the value. So we're going to say take values between 0 and uh, 21 and trans transfer them to values between 0 and 100. And that way we'll get them moving off a lot faster. And you'll see it increases the values there. So there we go. We've got the background animated. Let's just switch uh, the... Let's go back to our composition, close up the layer and just switch it on so we can see all of the layers. And what I'm going to do is just quickly move that background layer down to the back of the composition so that it's sitting behind um, my other characters. And what we're go I'm going to do is just build a preview for you so that you can see that playing. <laughs> Okay, so you get the idea. Um, the only thing is, what I want the background to do is kind of disappear as uh, the discs, these circles with the dancers in them, come to a rest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, 13 seconds. So let's just type in 13 period on the number pad to jump to 13 seconds. And for the background layer, what I want to do is open up the birth rate settings. So I'll double hit the U key. Um, to open up attributes that I've already um, adjusted and of course the birth rate appears there and I'm going to keyframe it so that over the space of say 10 frames so let's do a shift page down to move ahead 10 frames it goes down to a value of zero so it stops producing new discs at uh, 13 seconds 10 frames now if I just trim in my uh, start point and RAM preview that Let's just turn off the audio so that we don't have the audio going. Um, you'll see that what happens is it stops producing new discs at that point. So gradually the old discs fade out. And as the rotation stops, we end up with no discs at all. And then they zoom towards the camera. 
Now, obviously, I don't have motion blur and all uh, on at the moment, so we're getting a little bit of low resolution there, but that'll be a fixed uh, when we render the final output. The only thing is, I want the disks to reappear at this point where the text comes in again. So what I need to do is um, recreate the disk effect at this point. Now, I don't really want to animate that because um, I don't want to bring back the expressions. I want to create a completely new set of controls at that point. So an easy way of doing that is just to um, select the layer, decide where we want it to end. So if we scroll to this point here, so this is where we want the first uh, grid squares effect to end. So what I'm going to do is just simply split the layer there. So we'll say split layer. So before that point, we have the expressions controlling uh, the various different properties. After this point, what I'm going to do is adjust the expressions. Um, so what I'm going to do is remove the speed expression. Now I can just switch it off like this if I want to, um, rather than uh, remove it completely. And that gives me the option of being able to go back to it and reinstate it if I want to. And then I'm going to go back to sound keys. And I'm going to create a third control. So let's open up the sound keys effect and go into our range effect. And again, I've already taken the liberty of creating a range here. And if we scrub through this timeline, you'll see I've got another third range here. I've switched off the other ranges for now, which is giving me from this point, this kind of effect. And again, I'm going to switch on the audio so you can hear this. Okay, a very, very strong effect we're getting there um, to apply to the opacity from this point on. So what I'm going to do is generate those keyframes, click apply. And again, let's just make that bigger so we can see. So if we have a look at the range for the third set of keyframes, And going to the info palette, we can see if we select them that we have a minimum value of 14 and a maximum value of 100 for our opacity at that point. So let's go down to our second background layer and go to our opacity expression and let's just relink it to output 3. Okay, hit enter. And if we preview that from that point on. And we're also going to just quickly turn on the birth rate again. So we'll remove any keyframes from there. Put birth rate back up to three. And we're back with our lovely background. Okay, so let's just preview that. Okay, so now we have a more distinct flashing animation at the end as the text comes in. Now at the moment it's uh, starting right from the point of the previous layer. We want to adjust that as well, which we'll do in a second. So we've got a lot of flashing going on there. So what we're going to do again is just trim that layer. So you see it starts immediately after this one ends. I really don't want it to start until we get to round about, uh, until the text starts coming in. So maybe at about 20 seconds, uh, we'll trim that layer in. And we'll also animate the birth rate. So we'll have it starting at zero and then gradually building up over time. So let's just do it at zero. Here. Okay. So as the dancers finish, the grid starts to build and the text starts to come on again. Now the only thing that's left to do is the dancer continues to dance at that point, and I really want the dancer to stop dancing as the titles come into end. So the quickest, easiest way of doing that is just to create a freeze frame, which I'm going to do next. Let's just preview before we do that. Okay. 
So the bit where the music ends, which is at round about this second, uh, this fourth marker, we want the dancer to stop dancing. Now you'll notice that if I select this layer, there's no selection handles around the dancer, and that's because I'm not actually selecting this layer. I'm selecting the control layer for the Echo Space plugin. Now if you remember earlier, I showed you the shy layers um, that Echo Space creates. It's actually this layer that we're seeing within the comp. So I need to go down here and just select the layer that is um, visible. And then all I'm going to do is go to layer. Well, we'll split the layer first of all. So let's split the layer at this point. And the second half of the layer, the layer above, I'm going to go to layer, time, freeze frame. So at this point, if we just preview that, you'll notice, we just switch off the audio. You'll notice she dances and then she freezes from that point on. So we're left with a still image from that point on. Okay, there's one more thing that we can add to this to make it a bit more realistic, and that's to add um, something nice to the background, which will, is a reflect. warp which I also have installed on here and I'm going to use RG reflection and I'll drag that onto the background layer and you'll see that as I do it creates a reflection of my nice background of red discs. Now in order to control it I have these three controllers here which uh, relate directly to these controls here baseline start, baseline end, height and if we open that you'll see height and slant. Now the height and slant controls the angle and the baseline controls the area that the reflection starts at. So if I move that down to the bottom here, um, you'll see that the reflection now starts right at the bottom of that wall of discs. And I can adjust the an angle and slant as I want it. Now pulling these out will also affect the angle. So just be aware that if you pull the baseline out further, that's also going to affect the angle. And you may then need to do a little bit of um, fine tuning on that control there. Now with the floor on, it just makes it look so much more realistic. You get a really nice three-dimensional look from that. What I'm going to do now is open up the finished movie in QuickTime and play the final movie for you. Aye, now that was really, really great. You might even say it was groovy. If uh, you wanted to offend everyone in Scotland. Moving on. If you enjoyed this tutorial, you can check out Angie's website for more at www.angietaylor.co.uk. A renowned author in the After Effects world, you can find links to her awesome books and training on her website, including her latest book, Design Essentials for the Motion Media Artist, sold at Amazon.com, and her latest DVD, After Effects CS5, Learn by Video, available from Adobe Press. I even keep a few of her books on my small and sacred After Effects bookshelf, which should tell you something. And don't forget, you can download free trials of all of the Red Giant plugins used by Angie at RedGiantSoftware.com. And speaking of free, don't forget to check out RedGiantPeople.com where you can get tons of free animation or color correction presets for Trap Code and Magic Bullet and more. Once again, I'm Aaron Rabinowitz of the Clan Mac Rabinowitz for RedGiantTV.com. See you next time.